I can hear you, man. Coming through loud and clear. All right, brilliant. You can see my screen, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. All right, cool. Um, yeah, so, hi, everyone. Um, for people who don't know me, um, I go by the name of Zed Shorno online. Um, I'm 25 years old from United Kingdom. Um, I do bug bounties full time, so I have the privilege of waking up when the hell I want and smashing as many bug bounties as I possibly can and working usually to the late hours. <laughs> Um, I'm mo most active on Bug Crowd. Um, you've seen me on the leaderboards a few times, um, but I am, have been active on HackerOne as well, due to be active on Synac when I can find the time. <laughs> um, I've attended two HackerOne events. I've had the privilege of being invited by the great guys over there um, for their two of their events. Um, and typically, I just love helping people um, with bug bounties finding bugs um, and you know chaining those bugs to be as high critical as possible, really. So with that in mind, uh, my talk is mainly aimed at people kind of breaking into bug bounties, wanting to find their first bug, potentially trying to automate um, finding the low hanging fruit, such as cross-site scripting and that. Um, so we'll begin. So yeah, so basically, yeah, my talk is um, find your first bug and chain it to a higher priority. And um, we'll get onto that in a minute. Um, recon, what are you missing? So as um, Haddock explained, people are using sublist and things like that, but what are people not doing? And lastly, how you can do bug bounties for a living and keep sane when you spend a day finding no bugs at all. Because <laughs> it happens, trust me. <laughs> So we're going to begin with simple open URL redirects. Everyone knows what they are, but for people who don't, it's simply an endpoint where you input um, a URL and it will redirect to that URL. So they're extremely easy to find. I mean, you can simply visit aboutads.info and um, run that. And while you're opting out, uh, run burp while you're opting out and you will see a crazy amount of open URL redirects there. Even one that has a bounty program. If you can find it and make it work, be my guest. <laughs> so uh, second of all, um, you go onto Google and you do some dorking. So you can search for in URL redirect. Um, you know, there's other things such as uh, go to, return, return to, and things like that. And typically when you do find a, um, an open URL redirect, they are usually easily bypassed. Some websites will try filter against it to prevent you from doing it. Um, I've listed a few bypasses there. Obviously, that's not the full list. There are so many different ways of actually bypassing them. I do plan on releasing um, a long list of my, like my full list of what I use um, shortly after this talk. Um, so yeah, hopefully people know what open URL redirects are now. <laughs> so with that in mind, can we make them more useful? Because most um, bounty programs, some programs won't accept them, such as Google. Um, and other programs treat them as low priority. It's kind of, you know, wow, you've redirected somebody from our website to another website, what's your point? So typically my favorite one is, and I, you always find on pretty much every bounty program there is, especially if it's a brand new program, is chaining your URL, um, open URL redirect to account takeover. Now, most websites, depending on the niche of the website that you're gonna be testing, they will have a login with Facebook or log login with Google and things like that. Typically, even though the options are there to actually secure their apps, people will not whitelist their Facebook um, apps and you can chuck any URL as long as it's, it's their domain in there. So for example, um, if we had an app, Bug Crowd. So if Bug Crowd didn't whitelist um, to just bugcrowd.com forward slash Facebook, you could essentially give the redirect URL as lol.bugcrowd.com forward slash Facebook. So yeah. So typically with account takeover and open URL redirects, once if you can find um, a mobile, a Facebook application, sorry, um, and you've got yourself an open URL redirect, if you read, if you input the um, vulnerable URL into the Facebook app as a redirect URL and redir it redirects, it will redirect with the access token, as long as you set the response type to token. Now typically, and especially on mobile apps, when um, you are logging in via Facebook, to verify who you are, they're only given, you're, you're only giving them your access token. So to basically prove who you are, the access token that Facebook has generated, it passes to their mobile backend um, and says, look, this is who I am, and it logs you in, it sets your sessions, and you're logged in. Nine times out of 10, like I've said, every website I've tested, they've all been vulnerable to this. You can easily find an open URL redirect. They're typically on sign-in forms, register forms, logout forms, things like that. So easy to find and essentially here, easy to exploit and make some money. Um, 
The only thing to note with redirecting um, is to URL encode the redirect um, URI because I've noticed sometimes Facebook um, like will redirect to the first link, but the second like the URL that you wanted to go to, i.e. your open URL redirect, won't actually redirect for like I don't know why. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But typically, I will URL encode that parameter because when it gets decoded on the server side, it typically follows the redirect all the way to the end with the access token still on the end. So then, obviously, you've got their access token. You can now log into that user's account, and suddenly, depending on how this program treat account takeover, you've just potentially changed your simple open URL redirect to account takeover, which is you know maybe P3 to P2, maybe, maybe P1 if you're lucky, depending how they're feeling. Um, so yeah, um, another thing is people find stored cross-site scripting and I've, you know, I've been guilty of it in the past and they report it just as cross stored cross-site scripting. They're able to steal a user's session cookies or something like that and they get their bounty. What I've noticed people don't do is input where your stored cross-site scripting is located as the redirect URI and so when it redirects to your vulnerable URL, you can have JavaScript run um, to basically take their token and then you've just re-logged in. So even if this company, because nine times out of 10, when I've, again, when I've reported open URL redirects to take over accounts, they will fix the open URL redirect, but they won't fix their Facebook application. They will, they just will leave it. Even though I add in my report that you should, you know, hard code a URL in your Facebook app settings. So typically, they don't do that and you can go ahead and score a double bounty essentially. So that's one thing to note that I don't see many people doing. Um, I'm not quite sure why, um, but yeah. So again, for people missing this, um, you've got your open URL redirect. Um, and if they fix that, then redirect the Facebook app to the stored cross site scripting endpoint, your JavaScript will execute, you grab their OAuth token and now you've simply logged in to that user's account and Potentially, they will increase the priority based on the fact that it's still cross-site scripting and account takeover. But mm -hmm. again, that is down to the program's discretion and, you know, it's up to them. <laughs> so carrying on. Yep, go reopen the report. <laughs> so first of all, key things people miss. Um, bypassing filters. So I've joined old programs and been hunting around and found open URL redirects because they're easy to find people haven't been breaking filters as much as they should be. So the beauty of being a bug hunter is it's you and your computer and you can chuck whatever you want at the web application. It doesn't matter whether it works or doesn't work. Chuck as many characters in as many variations as possible. Some might work, some might not work. The end goal is you're going to be learning something and potentially you might find a nice bypass for many more websites. So yeah, fuzz as much as possible. You're, again, as you're, I don't know if this is actually in the way here. Um, so your favorite characters are gonna be the backslash, forward slash, um, the period, question mark, hashtag, um, equal sign, null byte, and um, create a new line. So the reason I've picked those is, so an example would be to use a null byte. Sometimes companies on the back end, like ignore this null byte and you are able to inject your domain after their domain for some unknown reason. Um, I use the question mark for creating a variable. So an example of a bypass I had was um, they would allow for anything dot, we'll use Google for example. So the parameter would only allow dot Google dot com forward slash anything you wanted. Um, if you put a forward, two forward slashes in front of the .google.com, you know, with error, nothing was working at all. However, if I put the payload lol.com question mark C equals .google.com, it saw the .google.com and thought, oh, this is a valid URL. But in reality, it's redirected to lol.com and the .google.com has been the variable. So that's one common thing that I've not seen people doing. Um, I do plan an update in my website to include a section um, for bypasses. I want to eventually have a, I know there are giant lists out there already, but for my own same purposes, because too many things to look at these days, um, I want to create a section to basically have bypasses for different types of vulnerabilities, such as cross-site scripting, um, CSERV, open URL redirects, et cetera, et cetera. Um, carrying on, why is it not doing anything? 
Okay, um, so not checking for any OAuth systems in place. So this is where your directory scanners come in place. So typically some websites will host their own OAuth system. Um, sometimes if you're logging in via mobile, it'll do um, a token exchange, etc. So again, check their mobile app, run a directory scanner and search for common things like 4 slash OAuth, et cetera. Um, do some Google dorking um, and basically just look around and see can you use your open URL redirect to do something more interesting rather than just redirect? Because the aim of the game is you want to impress this program and this company and in return, they're hopefully going to reward you very generously. And then it's a win-win for everyone. Um, so another common thing is most people know that I report to the same program on Bug Crowd religiously. Um, they have an, an enormous scope. Um, Basically, there was one parameter that I seen throughout the entire application, like altogether. Um, now, some people will say this is a root cause problem, and I would agree, but depending on how their backend is coded, um, they might not be able to fix that root cause problem. So letting them know where you're actually finding these issues is probably going to help them. I mean, the worst they're going to say is, we know about this, you know, it's a root issue, please stop reporting but hopefully they'll accept your report um, and you'll get a nice bounty and things like that. So yeah, you know, there are, there are tools out there to automate, um, if, you know, burp intruder to, you know, run the burp spider, send it to intruder, append the parameter that you've found um, and just run it against all endpoints and see how many you can find. I mean, I've personally done this and discovered at least 25 plus vulnerable endpoints in the matter of minutes from doing this and luckily every single bug was accepted <laughs> um so i've already said this but check their mobile app um if they have a web application sometimes they don't have their mobile app in scope and obviously you have to respect that um but typically they do have their mobile app in scope and they always use things like oauth um, especially when logging in um with facebook and things like that um, Typically, you can't use an open URL redirect on Google auth systems, I found. Typically, they're more secure. Um, I'm unsure why Facebook aren't. <laughs> um, but yeah, so yeah, check their mobile app as much as possible, you, you know. Um, and again, as I've already explained, redirect your OAuth to the stored cross site scripting. Um, I don't see many people, if any people, actually doing that. They may pay more for it, they may not but there's no harm in doing it anyway. Because the reason I say that is because some of you, I'm not actually watching this chat, I probably should, but some of you may be saying that stored cross-site scripting can get you account takeover anyway. And yes, that is true, but what about if they have got their session cookies protected, HTTP only, then you're, you're not going to be able to. Whereas you can with the OAuth system, because as long as you can steal that OAuth token, you can then get account takeover if their application has the functionality for it. So yeah, it's carrying on. So hopefully people learn some new things potentially with open URL redirects. Um, in the future, I hopefully do plan on doing more talks on different topics because obviously with being new to bug bounties, there is so much information to take in. There are so many different vulnerability types to, you know, there's so many different vulnerability types and things to find and things to do, tools to use. So hopefully that's given some people a little insight how to find an easy bug and chain that into something that's gonna reward you for your time. So carrying on, recon, going back in time. Um, this is a great story. Um, so one time, I have this, the favorite program I report to, their robots file, they leak pretty much every endpoint on their system. Um, I'm not quite sure who at the company thought that was a good idea, but it basically made my life a hell of a lot easier <laughs> because I simply just scraped their robots file, um, visited each endpoint, and you know that, that kept me busy for at least six months. Once I'd exhausted their robots file, you know, I was thinking, you know, I've done my Google dorking, I decided what hap what would what did their robots file look like back in time? And thankfully, there is a great website called Wayback Machine for this. And thankfully, there are also some tools out for this. So you can easily scrape all of the robots file on Wayback Machine for a certain domain, and it will output a great file for you. And suddenly you have, like bearing in mind, because it's on Wayback Machine, some of these endpoints may not work because they're old. But if they do work, the chances of them being runnable are extremely likely because they're old files that people have potentially forgot about. So, Again, but going back to why I decided to do this, um, 
when once I had done this and started running through my list, um, I found a certain endpoint which took two parameters: um, an encrypted UI, um, encrypted user ID, and a non-encrypted user ID. And if you give it both parameters correctly, it would reveal like your email address. So it was an opt-in out um, function, and there was also a login in function. So I first of all found the opt-in out function via the normal robots file that's currently live. And I found a way to basically harvest as many user ID and encrypted user IDs on the fly. So I could essentially run an attack and mass scrape all of their members' email addresses. Whether they had any protection in place to stop, you know, like rate limit and that, I'm not sure because I didn't test. Um, but then once I found in their robots file, there was an endpoint which was very similar to that endpoint. So I had no idea what parameters this endpoint would take. So I, on the off chance, give it the encrypted user ID and the non-encrypted user ID. And lo and behold, it logged me into my account. So I thought to myself, well, if I can reveal people's email addresses on this endpoint and they fixed it, and this is not this new endpoint isn't currently listed in their robots file, but it's still live. Have they forgot about this? And if I chuck my, you know, if I chuck them parameters at it, can I log into anyone's account? And lo and behold, yes, I could. <laughs> so I give it the encrypted user ID and the user ID because I still had methods for um, revealing them and anyone's account I wanted, I could simply visit one URL and I would be in their account. Um, now this web application that I test store things like obviously their email address, name, um, payment details, obviously not their full credit card details, but the last four digits and expiry, which as all of you know, is enough to go further into somebody's life. You know, it's, you don't want your payment details being out there. So yeah, um, I highly recommend trying these tools out, um, scanning some old robot files, seeing what is out there, what used to be out there, um, and basically, you know, go crazy, go back in time. Um, I would really love to see a tool, perhaps I will make one at some point, um, to basically, it's essentially like Burps, how Burps Spider works right now, um, but to spider their website back in time, but to get every single year. So it'd be really interesting to see, like, because obviously, you can't just scrape their robots file because they potentially might not list anything in there. So scraping their website from years ago and finding hard coded links, links to JavaScript files and links inside them JavaScript files, that'd be really cool uh, for someone to make if anyone feels up to the job. <laughs> so carrying on, um, I've just, as I explained, JavaScript files, um, finding them on Wayback Machine is great because um, they are your friends. They store lots of information usually, such as more URLs and endpoints that you can attack, hard-coded information such as users' email addresses, uh, methods for generating CSF tokens, for example. You know, there's lots of interesting things, even developer notes. Um, sometimes I've seen sometimes developers have left their notes in JavaScript files referencing to internal domains um, that I've never seen before. Obviously, you note that down, and then if you find a server-side um, request forgery, you can start seeing what is actually on that endpoint. So, into internal domains um, that I've never seen before. Obviously, you note that down, and then if you find a server-side um, request forgery, you can start seeing what is actually on. The yeah, cheers, Casey. <laughs> I was echoing. That. Um, so yeah, view JavaScript files for the. How do you minimize this? There we go. So yeah, view the JavaScript files for the discovery of new endpoints, um, hard-coded, uh, okay. Can you guys still hear me? Yeah, man, we can still hear you. All right, cool, Andy's just uh, playing me. <laughs> so yeah, um, you're viewing uh, hard-coded, for example, hard-coded app secrets. Um, I've seen them not only in JavaScript files, but actually in you know the DOM HTML. They've simply just defined it as variable equals app secret, you know? Um, <laughs> so yeah, um, app secrets, um, email addresses and things like that. Obviously, if they're hard coding those in JavaScript files, you can simply reference that on, you know, you host, um, host some HTML, reference that JavaScript file, and you can then start calling that information. And, you know, the user visits your website and this JavaScript file is referenced and executed. And if they're logged in, suddenly you potentially have their email address. And I have seen that in the past and actually leaked things like password reset tokens as well, sadly. Um, they was actually quite, I wouldn't say annoyed, but they emailed me back saying that this is gonna take them a while to fix because most of their application apparently ran on this one JavaScript file. Um, not quite sure why, but yeah. <laughs> 
So there are some tools out there for scanning JavaScript files for URLs and things like that. Um, I built my own a while back. Um, people are probably going to cringe at this, but I built it in PHP <laughs> because it, it works for me. Um, and if it works, it works. Um, so yeah, what could happen? So this is one methodology. Um, once I had basically exhausted my list of scanning, recon, you know, a robots file, Dorkin, et cetera, I wanted to see what was I missing? Had, had there been anything I'd missed? Um, Burp is a great tool. If you don't own it, I highly recommend you purchase it. Um, their spider tool is great. Um, you know, it's some, obviously it's not, sometimes you might get duplicate links which have the same JavaScript files on them and input files. Um, you know, it's just it what it is. So I built this tool called JS Scan and Input Scanner. And it's designed to work with Burp. So essentially, you run Burp Spider on the host you're wanting to attack. Um, and then you have two tool, two options. You can either copy the selected URLs, so that will be all the links that it has found and sent a request to and replied with. Or you can do another one, which is copy the links in selected items. Now, this will obviously give you JavaScript files, CSS files, et cetera. Um, if you want to pass all of them out and, you know, use that list, then that's fair enough. Um, I typically just use copy selected URLs. And then I built this tool called Zscanner. Um, so you use Burp Spider to discover the endpoints. You copy the items found and import it to my script. Uh, input Scanner will visit each endpoint and extract all of the input names. So if you had input name equals email. Um, not all inputs have names and some of them just have IDs and things like classes. So I also scrape those if no name is found. And on top of that, on each endpoint, um, I scrape the JavaScript files, which then goes into my JS scan, which we'll talk about in a minute. So with that in mind, um, it outputs it into a format that you can easily load back into Burp Intruder. So if you're imagining a mind map right now, um, you've just selected your host, we'll use Google again. You've just ran your spider for a while and you've got a nice list of like 2000 endpoints, for example, that you wanna scan. Um, you input it into Z Scanner. It will visit each endpoint, um, find all the input names, and it will output a tool, uh, a text file, sorry, which you can then easily input into Burp Intruder, and it will simply, you know, visit each URL that's been outputted with the parameters that it's found, um, with the payloads you defined. Um, so in Z Scanner, you have two files, urls.txt, which is obviously from the burps spider, and you have payloads.txt. Now you can add as many lines in here as you want for, if, for what you're wanting to test. So as you see in the screenshot, I've just tested for cross-site scripting by just using XSS and then a quote mark and then a single quote mark. Um, so yeah, you can easily test thousands of endpoints for low hanging fruit and finding easy things like cross-site scripting, um, SQL injection, even RCE, you know, you can easily just send it with the pipe command um, and you know, start testing for mass RCE really. <laughs> so with that in mind, you now also have JS scan. So again, built in PHP, which people will probably cringe at, but it, it works for me. <laughs> so JS scan it works with Z scanner. So Z scanner, will, again, as I said, will scrape the JavaScript files from the endpoints that you give it. Um, and then JS scan will visit each JavaScript file and output all the URLs it finds using regex. So the only ones I've got in there is it's looking for, uh, you can see in the bottom there, it's just looking for URL for slash EG with the single quote mark and a normal quote mark. Um, you're free to modify this code when I release it to look for anything else such as um, stored app secrets, um, users information, et cetera. But it's basically a tool designed to mass scan JavaScript files on the fly. So you don't want to be looking at JavaScript files manually and searching for things. It's much easier, I find, to scrape as many JavaScript files as you can and then mass look at them, basically. And, um, you know, see, see what is in those files because so many times I've found vulnerabilities in JavaScript files. Um, people, I don't know, if people are overlooking them or if it's new code being shipped or and I'm not quite sure, but it's happy days for me. <laughs> so using these tools, I've managed to automate pretty much 80% of my low hanging fruit. Um, so with the Z scanner, I simply, again, going back to the recon um, and scraping Wayback machine, I simply took all of their robots, um, files, all the endpoints that I found, mass scan for the input 
um, names, mass scan for JavaScript files, and suddenly I was prevented with like uh, presented, sorry, with like 40 plus vulnerabilities. Um, people probably think it's a bit cheaty and skiddy, but it automates the process of finding cross-site scripting, so you can spend more time um, finding more critical vulnerabilities, such as RCE via like file upload or server-side request forgery, or you can go back to you know doing your recon and playing around manually, basically. So, as it says at the bottom, the when the JavaScript scanner executes, it doesn't actually output anything. You're free to, because I didn't actually plan on releasing these until recently, um, a while back. So I haven't. You know, it's probably poor coding. People probably think it's bad, but it is what it is. You're free to rip it apart, change it, do what you want to it. I'm keeping in mind how it is because it works for me and I'm happy. So yeah, um, it doesn't, again, it doesn't output anything. Um, I like a visual view. So um, it will tell you the endpoint that that JavaScript was found on. That's one key thing I should probably note. So for example, if you scraped google.com forward slash um, test, and it found a JavaScript file, um, admin.js, it will tell, the script will tell you, hey, I found this on google.com forward slash test. So you know that this JavaScript file is being used on this endpoint. So it gives you more of an indication as to what is going on. Um, and yeah. So yeah, feel free to modify as you see. Um, again, I don't know if this is in the way. I'm going to move it. I don't know if I can just see this. I'm just going to leave it. Yeah, so my, it will, um, the Z scanner will output um, three files. So you have output dot, uh, get output.txt, which is a list of the URLs in a get format, um, which you again just input into a normal burp intruder. It then also has post output and post host output. So those are two files that you can again load into burp intruder with the pitchfork attack type. Um, you set obviously the post uh, output as that they're the parameters. So you set that at the bottom and then the post host is the endpoints. Um, and so the reason for outputting two, like two sets there, get and post is I found in the past endpoints haven't been vulnerable via a get request, but they have been vulnerable via a post request. Um, so that's one key thing to take away is even if you're sending a get request with this endpoint and you don't think it's vulnerable, send it with a post request and see what happens and not only that but change the content type you know it's change it to xml json you know just again reference back to the very start of this talk you're in control of what you're sending their server you cannot be wrong in this industry just chuck as much as you can and see what happens you'll be surprised <laughs> so yeah carrying on um finding bugs full time um i've had the privilege of being able to work um by myself and my own boss um, for all my life. I'm very grateful for it. Um, it can get very tiring, um, especially if you're not finding any bugs. So, you know, I've got bills to pay and things to do. People have, you know, you don't want, you want to find these bugs. So what can you do if you're not actually finding bugs and how can you keep sane and keep at this basically? Um, the first thing is, you know, everyone was new. Um, and everyone gets stressed, everyone chucks things at endpoints, people, it doesn't work. The only thing is to remain calm and take a step back and potentially see if somebody else has found something similar. So for example, if you've got an SQL injection error and you can't quite get it to run, like you can't get it to execute, um, you obviously try SQL map, um, try some SQL um, lists that people have released. And last but not least, but don't be afraid to ask people. People in this industry are extremely welcoming. Um, everyone wants to help each other, everyone, hence why this conference is going ahead. So yeah, don't be afraid to ask for help. Um, be professional. So we all know what it's like. You report a bug. Uh, they take months to actually see your bug, months to triage, and then months to fix. And you end up waiting potentially a year to get paid. Yes, it gets annoying. Um, it all depends on what program you are reporting to. Um, so you need to be smart and learn where to spend your time. So don't, find, don't get invited to a program and go crazy on it. Typically just test the waters, find some simple bugs, see what is easy for you to find and report it and see what happens. Um, typically you, on bug crowd, um, since they are managed programs, you don't have to wait a long time to actually have your bug triaged um, and paid out. So that's one good thing about managed programs. I know HackerOne and Synac both have managed programs as well. Um, I've used, I've 
tested a few on Hacker One, um, not on Synac, but I have heard great things. So yeah, be smart, learn where you're reporting to, learn what you're reporting. You are, you know, you manage your time correctly. Um, and a great thing is to also look at disclosed reports. Um, so obviously Hacker One disclosed reports, people will post, post blog posts and they post their timeline as to how quickly it was fixed, et cetera. See where other people are potentially getting paid within 24 hours or within a week. Um, see if people are being paid fair, et cetera. So for example, if they're getting $50 for RCE, you know that your cross-site scripting will probably get maybe $1 or nothing at all. So manage your time extremely well. Um, you don't need an update every week. Um, so many disclosed reports, we've all seen them, um, where people are asking for an update every, every week. Um, hey, is there an update? Now, I understand some people do this so they can get their bug triage quicker, they can get their bug fixed quicker, so they can get paid quicker. I understand that. And hopefully bug bounties change um, where we do get paid on triage, because in my opinion, once a company triages your bug, that's them accepting, yes, this is a valid bug, you have done your work. Um, I understand why co some companies do wait to pay out when it's resolved, and that's because they're worried that some researchers may publish this. Um, but again, if any program owners are watching this, just communicate with the researcher and be very clear that you, if you're going to pay them early, tell them not to disclose this bug at all, essentially, or at least pay them half up front and half when it's resolved. Um, bug counters get extremely annoyed when they're waiting around. Their bug is in the open state. They want to know if it's been accepted. They want to make sure it's not a dupe. Um, so yeah, I really wish companies would get onto these as soon as possible. But if you've reported something silly, don't ask for an update every week, unless it's a P1. So if you've reported something and you can do something like on Zomato and get access to their source code and et cetera, then yes, go crazy at them and tell them, hey, you need to get this fixed right away. Um, if they don't fix it, then that's their problem, isn't it? Um, Hacker One, Bug Crowd, Synac, etc. cetera. Um, if you feel like your bug needs more attention, I recommend you reach out to them. They're there to help you. They're there to make your experience a lot better and more smooth. So just reach out to them with your report number, explain why you believe this is like critical and they need to fix this. And you know, hopefully somebody will look at it pretty quick. Um, Chain bugs to achieve the highest possible impact to usually leads to a bigger payout. So as we saw in the open URL redirect example, we could have just reported it as a redirect and potentially maybe got $100. Um, but if chaining it to an account takeover, I may potentially get upwards of $500. So even though bug bounties are typically a race to report the bug first, because you don't want to get that dreaded dupe, uh, et cetera, the, br the brilliant part of being part of small knitted private programs where there's only like, you know, 20, 30 plus researchers is you can typically hold on to the small bugs until you need it for something more critical. Um, it's also great if you are in any Slack channels or if you know other people running on this program to potentially collaborate and see if you could put your bugs together. Um, as I've said um, at the very start of this talk, there is an open URL redirect on a program that has a bounty via the uh, about ads.info website. Um, so again, if you can, I'm not going to list who it is here. Um, it's up to you to find it because you have to chain two things together. But if you can make it work and do something good with it, I'm really interested to know because I have looked around. Um, if you really do want me to give you just the vulnerable URL, then maybe talk to me. <laughs> um, so you are going to have bad days, as I've explained. I've had them multiple times. I've come on my computer, I've ran scripts, I've checked endpoints. These endpoints are giving me weird errors and I just cannot get them to work and I get stressed. It happens to everyone. You will sometimes go weeks without finding bugs. It all depends on the programs that you are active in, the invites that you've got, your knowledge, etc. Take Just take time out to relax. You, unless you are doing this full time, um, you don't need to find a bug every day. Um, so take time out to relax, play some games, go take, go do some exercise. There's nothing better than doing some exercise, letting some steam off to clear your head and just really unwind and just collect your thoughts. Try and work out where you're potentially going wrong with bug bounties. Where are you spending too much time um, and not finding anything, etc. Um, and one thing I really love to do is once the report has been moved to the resolve state is, you know, go retest it. So depending on how big the company is and how big their scope is, 
different teams will fix different endpoints and different sections of the website. So I've had, um, for example, on this company, certain endpoints have been fixed fully. They, you know, they've done a great job of fixing it. I've retried it. I simply can't get it to work. That bug is fully fixed. Whereas have, I've had different endpoints where they haven't fully been fixed. They've only um, sanitized certain characters. So I can just simply create a bypass, you know, filter bypass, and suddenly I can now reopen this report and say, you haven't made a good enough fix on this, basically. I don't like doing that, potentially, um, because in my opinion, once you've reported a certain endpoint as being vulnerable and they know about it, it's kind of gone. Um, I always ask for permission to re-report bugs. If I've broken it, I always get permission to do it. Um, so if you do break um, a bug on a report, you can either go one way, you can either just report it on that bug um, that you've already reported and say, hey, look, this is broken again, and they may reward you more, or you can reopen a new report. Again, it's probably down to, you should probably talk to the program and potentially the program that you're reporting on. And it would also be based on the severity and how much work you put in to actually bypass the filter. So if you actually did some crazy magic and completely created something new within like two hours, then you, know, you deserve a bounty. It all depends on how much time you're putting in and things like that um so yeah um find a program that you love that will treat you fair um and then once you do give it your all so we all know um the number one hacker on hacker one um mr hack uh, also known as try to hack had the privilege of meeting him last year in vegas extremely talented individual everyone knows he's found his favorite program his niche um he knows you know he knows how they work so the benefit of finding a program that you love um, and treat you fair and well is you can really get a feel for how their program works. You can understand what they're coded in, common mistakes they're making with their coding. For example, if they're pushing like new code, you know exactly if you found like 15 IDORs, you know to suddenly try IDOR because they might be vulnerable to it. Um, true story that, by the way. <laughs> Um, so yeah, you, you get a real big feel um, for how the company and program work. You, um, you not, not only that, but you're going to be getting trek fair. So if the company is triaging your bug within 48 hours and they're paying you within seven days, you know to give it your all. Go absolutely crazy. Um, give it your all, basically. That's, that, that's the way to sum that up. That's essentially what I've done and what other people have done. They have basically just gone crazy on it. Um, so yeah, um, sharing is caring. Um, I've had the privilege of being accepted to talk on this Bug Crowd talk. Um, thank you to everyone at Bug Crowd, obviously. Um, go away. I love people that share bugs, not only bugs, but filter bypasses as Jason did in his um, presentation. It not only helps you because somebody might find a way of doing something better, um, cause, and then they might tell you about it. So it will not only make you a better bug hunter, um, but you're helping other people. Um, if you're helping other people then that makes you a great person. Um, not, you know, I'm not saying people are greedy in this industry because they are far from it. Um, and obviously not everyone can disclose their bugs. Not all companies allow you to disclose their bugs, sadly, but if you do get permission to disclose your bug, then I highly recommend you do it. Um, you know, you'll, you'll be helping everyone. <laughs> um, I'm just going to check to make sure there's nothing I have missed here. Um, so I've discussed um, chaining the open URL, open URL redirect with an OAuth system to achieve account takeover. Um, lots of people have disclosed bugs on this. If you would love an example of this, um, I can give you guys one. I can make a post about it. Um, go away, Pete. <laughs> Um, uh, what else is there? Um, people need to fuzz more. So again, I've joined old programs and um, found endpoints that I can clearly see people have tried to attack because this company have actually, you know, they're not vulnerable to cross-site scripting, for example, but there is a way to bypass their filter they have in place. So fuzz as much as you possibly can. Um, hopefully my tools will enable you to automate finding cross-site scripting. Um, try the vulnerable parameters. So this is one thing, uh, I should probably go back and mention this. <sighs> Wish I could mute those notifications. <laughs> uh, yeah, so one thing, um, <laughs> 
one thing that I haven't seen people do is all the vulnerable parameters that I find I will store in a text file. Um, the reason for this, as I've already explained, is because try this vulnerable parameter on as many endpoints as you possibly can. Just because it's vulnerable on one endpoint, it might be vulnerable on other endpoints. Um, you have no idea. It might even do something different depending on what the parameter is called. For example, if it's, an, if it's called action, you know, who knows what it could do. You might be able to get RCE on one endpoint and cross-site scripting on another endpoint. So that's one key thing. Definitely save vulnerable parameters that you find and try them on as many possible places as you can. Um, let's make sure I've not missed anything else. I've discussed using the Wayback Machine um, for scraping robots file. Um, if anyone does take up the idea of making a tool to scrape a website, a complete websites and like, you know, hard coded URLs, JavaScript files, everything, then, you know, be my guest. I'd love, uh, maybe the bug bounty forum people in their Slack channel, we can get together and we can create something like that. Who knows? Um, I've talked about, I'll go back to about my tools in case people missed it. Um, so essentially you pick your tool. I've used auto trader here. Hopefully they're not watching this. <laughs> Um, you spider the entire program with whatever tools you have. There are lots of tools out there for spidering. You may have your custom tools, who knows? Um, and then simply input it into my input scanner. Uh, it'll visit and then define your payloads in the payloads.txt. So depending on what you want to test for. And then just leave the script to run depending on how many you have inputted. Um, you know, go out, have a meal with your girlfriend, wife, play with the kids, go to bed. I don't know. You might wake up to quite a few vulnerabilities overnight as I have. Um, so yeah, you run the scanner, input it into Burp Intruder, and then you can check using regex to see what has basically been found. As you can see there in the bottom, easily found quite a few cross-site scripting already. Um, had to hide the payload URLs there. <laughs> Didn't actually intend to find those vulnerable parameters, but yeah. <laughs> um, one key thing I should note is it may be noisy. Um, so obviously, if they say no automated scanners, then you do have to respect their, um, you know, their rules. Um, I typically, in my Burp Intruder, will always add my username and the program I'm running on. So for example, if it is BugCrowd, I'll have my user, ag user agent BugCrowd hyphen Z Shorno, just so if there is any problems, you know, they know it's me, they know I'm not here to cause any harm. And if I've accidentally broken anything, they can quickly link it back to who I was and realize, oh, this guy's in our bug bounty program. He's actually found something he wouldn't have known otherwise, if that makes sense. So it's all about working with the company and they know who you are and what you are doing. Um, and then obviously we have the JS scan um, from the input scanner. It will scrape JavaScript files um, and then output a list of URLs found in that endpoint. I've explained before, you're free to modify it um, to find hard-coded app secrets, users information such as emails, uh, developer notes. I'm not quite sure what regex you'd use to find developer notes, but if you can come up with one that can find it pretty good, then please do tell me because I love reading developer notes. Some developers get very angry. <laughs> um, and yeah, there's the output. Um, let's see. Yes, yeah, so I've explained how I've you know I've automated finding low hanging fruits. I highly recommend people do do that. Um, and yeah, I think I was due to end at like half past. Caleb went a bit over, so we'll carry on going. Let's see what else I can talk about. Um, so going back to the sharing is caring, and why I love it, and why this talk is amazing, and. You know, even if you're just uploading videos to YouTube like Pete does, or if you're writing books like Andy Gill, for example, and Pete does as, as well. Um, and also, I have to give a massive shout out to File Descriptor. I only know him as Tony on our chat, but he's an extremely talented individual. Um, everyone in this chat, I'm not reading the chat, but everyone will agree. Um, him and his team are amazing at Q53 and the things they do. He has helped me with so many bugs. So that's why Sharon is caring. If I didn't reach out to people, um, I wouldn't have reported some bugs. He's helped me with a lot of things. Um, there's also a lot of interesting posts around now, like um, Arnie Swindon's The Subdomain Takeover on Uber. That write-up was extremely detailed and well-written. Um, he seriously deserves a massive shout-out. Um, Franz, um, his Subdomain Takeover, again, had the privilege of meeting him um, in Vegas and San Francisco, an extremely talented individual. Um, I can't think of any 
more blog posts from the top of my head, but there are quite a lot out there. Um, and hopefully there's going to be a lot more. Um, I do have a few blog posts in the work that I'm waiting for permission. Um, and Sam, do I have time? Because Caleb went over to quickly discuss no, this for five minutes. Um, you, you want me to end right. this? Yeah, you're out of time. Sorry, man. <laughs> All right, no worries. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity for this. It's it's good. Yeah. So um, thank you so much, Sean. Uh, you can tweet at Sean at uh, at Zshano, I believe. Is that your username? Yeah. It's, yeah. It's at Zshano. Yeah. Cool. Cool. So tweet at Sean. Um, and yeah, we're now going to go over to uh, Ben Sadijapur. Um, but thanks again. And also, uh, just a reminder to everyone, you can tweet about the conference using the hashtag it takes a crowd. Um, definitely give, uh, give Sean a shout out. And, uh, and yeah, thanks guys. We're going to start with our next presentation.